right. I'm going to call to order the uh, November 18th, 2019 meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, recorded by ACMI. Uh, the agenda this evening is environmental design review, uh, public hearing, special permit 3610, filed by Apothka, Inc., uh, 1386 Massachusetts Avenue. This has been advertised and we are here this evening. Apologize for technical difficulties getting started a little bit late. Um, I do see some new faces this evening, so just to kind of give people a rundown of what's going to be happening, uh, in case you're not familiar with this, the applicant's going to come up. Uh, they're going to have an opportunity to present. The board may ask questions from time to time. The board usually will ask questions after the applicant presents. Uh, once that's finished, I will open the uh, agenda to any public comment. So people in the crowd who wish to have their say, please. Uh, hold any questions, comments until that time. Anybody who wants to speak will be recognized and given the opportunity to do so. Uh, sit here until everyone's had that opportunity. Uh, then the board may ask additional questions, uh, <coughs> put some requirements on the applicant. Uh, we may take a vote. I think it's unlikely this evening, but it depends on uh, where we go from here. So with that, uh, I'm going to open up and ask the applicants to uh, come forward, introduce yourselves, begin your presentation. Please, I can give you this microphone, sort of, if you'd like to use it. Uh, it's a bigger room than we're usually used to. Oh, can, you, uh, can everyone hear me? Use the microphone. Use the microphone. Thank you. So, I'll do my best to use it. Take right there. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I am Joseph Fleckach. I'm the CEO of Apotheca Inc. With me tonight, I have Bill Silverman from Vicente Sederberg, uh, who's our legal representative, and Anthony Cap uh, Capuchetti from Hayes Engineering, who helped us put this all together for you guys. So I am here seeking a co-location special permit for a medical and adult use cannabis retail store at 1386 Massachusetts Avenue. As you can see, we're using largely the existing building. We will be redoing the parking lot to add spaces for a total of 12. And so far, our existing medical facility at 11 Water Street has been operating for over a year now without any negative incidents and working closely with various town departments. When we came up and spoke to you to get the special permit for that location, there were a lot of concerns, and I think that we've far surpassed most expectations with that operation. And I'm here to commit to you that we will do the same if this is approved. There's a benefit that Arlington has working with Apotheca on this location for a co-location. About three weeks ago, we opened up our co-located adult use and medical dispensary in Lynn, right on the Linway. We are directly on that state highway, and we see about 40,000 cars every single day driving by our location. To date, with a parking lot similar in size, we have been able to accommodate a high of 494 transactions without a single hiccup. And so far, we've been able to get customers and patients in and out of the store with an average transaction time of under four minutes, far exceeding the metrics uh, that we submitted with this application. In regards to the building, as some of you know, you have Two, two tenants right now, Arlington Swifty Print, and you have the Bank of America ATM. The Bank of America <coughs> ATM is planning to stay in, the, in, its, in its space, walled off from the space that we'll be taking over, and we plan on adding a new doorway uh, to the front of the building to allow our customers and patients to come in. Additionally, with the way we set up the parking lot and with existing curb cuts, one way in, one way out, be able to manage the traffic flow efficiently. With that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Tony Capuchetti um, to keep going through this process. And obviously, all three of us will be happy to answer any questions that anybody may have. Thank you. Uh, Tony Capuchetti, Hayes Engineering, 603 Salem Street, Wakefield, Massachusetts. Um, we've been working with Apotheca since 2016 uh, on a number of their facilities, uh, including the last Arlington site. Uh, this site, again, is an adapted reuse of an existing uh, commercial building. 
uh, looking to do as, as minimal changes to the site as possible. However, uh, we are committed to adding six additional spaces. Uh, the previous uh, parking spaces were in an angled configuration. Uh, there is enough room to um, back out, turn around, and, and circulate the building. Uh, that, that allowed us to add uh, six additional spaces plus make one of those spaces a uh, van accessible handicap space. Um, so uh, that would bring the, the facility into compliance with the ADA and pass AAP uh, parking requirements. Uh, we'd also provide an accessible route um, to the existing walkway here, uh, which would allow to access the front entrance, and then the exit would come back out to the side and around uh, <coughs> to that space. Uh, there's some uh, unnecessary uh, additional impervious, uh, so in order to balance out the, the newly created impervious from uh, reconfiguring the parking lot, uh, the sidewalk on uh, what is the east side of the building and to the south of the building, there's a short, uh, it's not quite a full sidewalk, it isn't a compliant sidewalk, it's, a, it's about two, two and a half feet of paint, uh, concrete that would be removed to balance out the, uh, the increases in additional impervious. The site itself, uh, looking at IT trip generation rates, uh, you're looking at about uh, 560, I think it's 556 um, trip ends per day uh, coming to the facility. Uh, that's for the proposed marijuana use. There's very limited study data uh, for marijuana use. This is four, four sites that we looked at uh, for the IT trip generation rates. Uh, it's a fairly new use. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard of the, the, the horrors from the first two that opened in Massachusetts. Uh, I can assure you that's because of the the very limited uh, amount of that uh, type of facility. Uh, since then, there's been a, a number of facilities that have opened, uh, in Massachusetts being one of them. I think on your opening day, you did about 300 mm -hmm. customers. We had an off parking spot, we had buses, uh, none of which was needed. Another project in Brockton just opened up uh, similar circumstances. Uh, they're, they're not as, as trendy as they were six months ago. Uh, to give you a rough idea, though, we did some studies in June at uh, Alternative Therapies Group in Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, their trip generation rate per 1,000 square feet was about 315 trip ends per 1,000 square feet compared to the 256, I believe, the MTE uh, calculated. Uh, and that was still, there were only about nine dispensaries in the entire state at that point in time. So uh, as we open more dispensaries, uh, what we're seeing is that rate is declining. Uh, Brookline, um, far larger dispensary, we're talking 20,000 square feet, 20 point of steel ter terminals. A um, bit more trip generation, however, um, but they were kind enough to let us interview their, their clients as they were exiting. We were getting about 53.7% um, of those customers were saying this was a pass-by. Um, they had planned to be on this route, diverted from the route uh, briefly, went to make their transaction and continued on their route. Um, and that's comparable to a pharmacy with other drive through window, sees about 49%. Uh, in our study, we didn't take any discount for this pass by rate. Uh, what, what we're hoping is that the downtown commercial area um, in Arlington uh, will have that same effect. You'll have people who are planning to be in that downtown uh, that carry over to, to this uh, facility on their route. Uh, we did receive the, the comments from the board, uh, from the uh, sorry town staff today. Uh, reviewed that. Uh, we did not have a chance to prepare a, a, a full response. Um, some of the questions that came up uh, were asked to bicycle parking. Uh, the ordinance was a little difficult to, to ascertain whether or not new spaces would be required. Uh, if they were, we did take a look. Uh, without increasing impervious, we would use um, turf stone to the east of the, the building and add um, two racks uh, that would allow for two bicycles on each side before. Uh, bicycle uh, parking spaces, um, and Wellington is very uh, bicycle friendly, uh, so we would be more than happy to accommodate that. Um, the, the other questions were some of the, the numbers we, we put out there. Uh, the floor plate is designed for 105 people maximum capacity. We don't anticipate that many people being in the store at a given time. Um, and then we, we kind of gave you a, a number based off the peak hour. Uh, which I believe was 30, 66 vehicle trips, which is 33 vehicles in the peak hour. Uh, so that basically says that our parking lot would have to turn over three times in that peak hour, which would be like a 20 minute transaction time. Um, and as uh, Mr. Lukasha said, uh, they're averaging about four minutes. And that, that lends to uh, the way this use, it, it's a very new use for me, although we've been involved in about 80 of these facilities so far in Massachusetts. Um, 
what we're seeing is consumers tend to use uh, that there's a, a number of websites that you know make the uh, the menu of products available. Uh, they go on uh, Leafly, I believe, is one of them. They go on and they can see live what products are available, so so people know exactly what they're getting purchased. It's not a lot of window shopping that goes on. Um, that tends to be more on the medical side than the only. Uh, and and I I don't think you're seeing you know after the first one or two transactions. Uh, I'll let Joseph speak to that, but I think they they then find the, the medicine that's best suited for them and continue with that. But uh, as far as the recreational co customers go. They look down the list, they figure out what they want, and they know when they walk in the door. Uh, it's a very, very quick turnaround. Um, we did uh, try and comply with the, the landscaping requirements, uh, adding, uh, where possible, additional trees, uh, looking to take out some of the, the landscaping that is uh, uh, not in the greatest repair, uh, and adding some, some trees that will uh, provide some, some buffering, some screening, a mix of deciduous flowering, and uh, evergreen trees, uh, as well as some ground cover to try and clean up the, the space. Uh, you know that that is something that we want as a, a very attractive uh, facility. Um, and, and when the board gets to engineering questions, I'd be happy to answer any any questions you have. Uh, otherwise, I turn it over to Phil Silverman from the SEC, where uh, we could speak a little more to the, to the site. If I had to still on this point, so uh, I'll be unusual to be a lawyer that doesn't say a lot. Uh, Really, not a lot to add other than uh, I just want to sort of reiterate the, the traffic issues. I know that's a big concern everywhere. My firm represents about 100 of these businesses in Massachusetts, and we are finding that uh, a lot of the initial uh, wonder about this um, has sort of diminished. And so the last uh, several, there's about 35 dispensaries open right now, and the last several, there just hasn't really been much of an issue. Um, you know, we're not seeing the people coming in from New York anymore with curiosity and Connecticut and such. So all good news for the industry, I think, uh, for, for Arlington as well. So I'll leave it at that. If there's questions, uh, let us know. We're happy to answer. Okay. We'll take the mic back. <clears throat> Thank you. I do think we have a few questions. And, uh, I think what I'll do is begin with Ken. We'll go right, uh, right down the line. and then. Anything else to ask? Wrap that up, then turn it over to the public. I'm going to focus on a few things, and I'll let the other point more focus. I know they're going to focus on the others. So, what I'm going to focus on is um, lighting on a rear parking lot. I noticed that your photometrics, as shown on L2. You have, uh, you have pretty good lighting uh, where the cars are parked. Yeah. Roughly, you know, they're about, on average about five, which is good. But in the drive lanes and the corners, uh, it's pretty weak there. Uh, I was wondering, would you guys be interested in adding some lighting along the driveway on the incoming and outgoing? So as someone's walking down the street, it doesn't, when you look up that driveway, it's not dark. It has a more safer, friendlier, there's, there's, uh, there's clean lighting back there and, and safe back there. Uh, we wouldn't have a problem adding additional lighting. Uh, the reason why it tails off uh, is, is twofold. One, there is street lighting that we were unable to model. We don't know the fixtures. And we didn't want to um, give any sort of false sense or, or representation of what's going on. Uh, the other is a, a lot of boards don't like to see light trespassing at the property line, even onto the right of way. Uh, so we were. We were cognizant of that, and we did not want to put uh, fixtures that would, would exit onto the right of way. I don't personally see a big issue uh, because they're shielded. Uh, these are all dock sky compliant lights, so you can't see the actual fixture itself. Uh, I think in an urban district, if you had some lights pull over onto the sidewalk, I don't see that as a bad thing. But if the board. I'm not concerned about the sidewalks per se. I'm more concerned about the driveways up, and right when you turn the corner, that's fairly light there. You put some, some lighting there. If we could, if we could add an additional light here and try and minimize the amount. That yep, and then also on the other same, side too. Same thing. We could go uh, put a building on a light here and, and try and minimize the spill. Yeah, because eight corn lights up front don't really do much of anything on the streets. Uh, that was one. The other one is um, there was an existing. I don't know what you call it. If we're looking at that one, we are just to the right of the building. 
There, was, there used to be sidewalking. You took that all out for landscaping in there, right? Correct. I was wondering if you would be able to take that opportunity, okay? Make that into some sort of um, rain garden. Okay? And what I mean right now is the whole parking lot slopes right out to the sidewalk. Okay? The two catch basins that are on the driveway, they don't really catch all the water. Uh, I've been there, I walked around there. It just goes out to the, across the sidewalk into the street and then goes down. Uh, it, it is a limited area. I realize. To, to make a DEP compliant, it doesn't have, have, okay. I don't think we'll have the area of the body. To make something that will capture maybe the annual storm or, or less, you know, the more frequent storms that we see, yep. um, I think we could we could carve that out. There is a, a, a roof drain pipe that comes into the back of the catch basin, so we could uh, put a T into that and just have a, a, a standpipe that comes up that would you know, allow for a, an inch or two to settle in the rain garden, then over top and continue into the back of that catch basin. I'd like to go a step further than that. Uh, I'd like to go and put on each side of the uh, drive lanes. You're, gonna, you're not the engineer, I'm not, I'm not an engineer, okay? okay? But as you go up, the, uh, wherever it's feasible, put in a trench ring that will capture any water going down that um, driveway on either side and then pipe it into your landscaping here. Have the landscaping act as your, well, the, the whole thing is, is, is landscaping right on the, hold on a minute, let's stop here. Sorry. That's, uh, so this is a slight misrepresentation here, and there's a giant transformer pad here. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's, you put a trench ring right across here, and somewhere right here, you can have it dump right into this thing here, put some sort of culvert here in, underneath the plantings, and then it, it'll, it'll leach, into the, leach back into the ground as much as it can, put up a little overflow here in case it can't take it, I'll go into the drain there. So now you're taking. I, I I think that can be accommodated again with the caveat that this is going to be those it's less than one be, year. It's not going to meet the state court requirements yeah. of the whole thing because you don't have enough space. I understand that. Yeah. No, that's not. But a, but your intent. Drain. That your intent to do that. That's that. And it's very minimal expense. To, no, I I think that's reasonable. Okay. For the that's, uh, that's all I have for now. Right. Thanks, Ian. I'll go down to the other in a second. I just have a few questions that I want to get in before we get on down the line here. Um, one of the things that I think is going to be your main concern here is how you deal with uh, queuing people around the site. Uh, you know, <clears throat> this line on Mass Ave is mostly commercial, but there's a neighborhood directly behind here, and uh, certainly we don't want this facility to impact them negatively. Um, now, I know Apotka is committed to being a good neighbor in the area, uh, but I'm more concerned about your customers and what steps you're going to take to manage them and their actions, uh, even if it's just the increased noise from, from an extra 50 or 100 people in the neighborhood on a given, given day. A lot of people work from home, uh, don't want their weekends to start. Talk to me about that a little bit. Sure. So again, I could draw my experience that we just had right now in Lynn over the last three weeks. First of all, we almost never have a line outside the door. Uh, we get people in and out very, very quickly. And the way we build our floor space is very shoppable. So it's not like you'll experience in another dispensary. We walk in and immediately in a queue and you have to wait to speak to a person. Um, so for us, when you come in, we actually have displayed, we have an open full time concept uh, that you can also see in our, in our medical dispensary right now, so that when customers come in, we get them in the door um, and we're able to check them in as quickly as possible. And then when they're inside the store, they're able to either browse or come in and check out. Um, that creates virtually no line outside. Uh, I think the longest line we've had is right before we're about to open, and you, you're talking about like 10 people, uh, and they get processed in very quickly. Yeah, the reason I ask this is I know there's a concern <clears throat> over, I guess, Netta in Brookline, where they have people queued in the parking lot, uh, and then for, for one section, and they have another section for uh, walk ups, essentially. Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate that, and how do you plan to handle that? So, the type of constraints here in the space. So, like I said, 494 people seen in Lynn, not an issue, not a single issue, and so, and we also have outside uh, security inland. Um, whenever we're open, we're going to do the same here, and 
people aren't allowed to stay around the property once they make their purchase. Regulatorily speaking, they leave, mm -hmm. get into their car, leave. Um, and we enforce that very, very carefully. Plus, people don't necessarily want to hang around. So we don't see people loitering outside after they made their purchase, and we get them in very, very quickly. And I appreciate that you provided your security plan. Um, I didn't have a chance to dig too deeply into that, but I'm glad it exists. What sort of uh, uniform town official police will be on site? Okay. So we'll coordinate with uh, local PD. And with Lynn, for example, we had a Lynn PD in the parking lot uh, during our opening weekend and a state trooper on the highway because it was a state highway. Um, Neither Lynn PD nor the state PD required it past the opening weekend because they saw that our operation was able to easily manage it. Here we'll do the exact same. We'll start with a police detail that we will cover and pay for, and we'll have them until Arlington PD says they don't want to require it. Okay. All right. The other thing I didn't see in the plans that you gave us, and, and I don't think I missed it, maybe I did. Um, <clears throat> I know there's not a lot you can do as far as signage uh, from, from the state regulations. Um, right now, Swifty windows are big, wide, open. Mm -hmm. uh, I know one concern when we went through the medicinal uh, approval process was people being able to see in. Obviously, that's not the case with Water Street, but do you plan to frost the windows at all or keep um, looking at from window shopping, essentially? So the most important thing is, that's part of the regulations. You are not allowed to see into the dispensing area from the outside. Every window will be frosted. Uh, except for one, which is the one that's on the, there's a second floor, not really a second floor, but double high atrium window that you cannot see through unless you're in a helicopter. Um, and that window we will not frost so that as much natural light in. Similar to in our, uh, Water Street, since we're on the third floor, the windows don't didn't have to be frosted, so someone can look in. Okay. All right. And then lastly, uh, as far as parking, it comes to mind that the Bank of America ATM that's there now is a remnant of what it used to be a bank. I think there's a drive up window mm -hmm. still there. One, do you have any control over the drive up window? We do not. Fix that. Okay. Two, do Bank of America customers have the right to park in the parking lot? Like, is that going to impact your ability to use all the spaces and time? Our agreement is for us to have control, full control of the parking lot. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll turn it over to David. Thanks for being sensitive to the transportation issues and, and for bringing some focus to that. Uh, I, I do want to talk uh, a little bit more about that. Um, this uh, could potentially be the first uh, retail operation on this side of, of Boston. Um, I don't know exactly the timing of when some of the other ones are planning on opening, but um, there is the potential that it, it could, for some period of time at least, draw people uh, who aren't just passing by on, on, their, on their normal travels. Um, so, uh, you know, I recognize that there isn't a lot of available data out there on, uh, on trips generated by these kinds of facilities. Um, but I'm, I'm really wishing that, that we had a more robust <coughs> traffic study. Uh, and if there, if there is more that we could do to understand the potential, uh, considering the specific geography of this location and um, the, um, the, the universe of of retail operations that are in progress um, to open uh, in the surrounding area and the potential timing of that with, uh, you know, versus when, when you might open, uh, just to, to better understand what the reality might be. So I think, uh, before you answer, <coughs> and I'll let you go, one thing we might do, and I was going to suggest this, is we have the Transportation Advisory Committee weigh in on the parking, on the, uh, traffic study that's been done and have their opinion as to whether it's sufficient or more homework should be done. We've done that in the past. It's been a while since we've asked for their help, but I know they're willing and able to do so. Absolutely. So if I may, um, our Lynn location is the second closest to Boston. Um, the closest one after that was in Salem. No one in Saugus, Revere, 
East Boston, uh, Marblehead, Swampscott, any of the surrounding neighborhoods, and 40,000 cars driving by every single day already. And our average daily visitors is between 300 and 400 visitors a day. Um, I wouldn't expect this location to be higher than that, uh, just based on that data and the fact that you will have to see dispensaries opening up in Cambridge. You will see it in Somerville. You will see it in Malden. Um, it's coming, Newton's uh, with Garden Remedies. Um, and so it's not going to be the only game in town, so to speak. And even then, that we have that reciprocal experience in Lynn just now with all the surrounding communities, San Salem, with no dispensaries and us being the only ones open. And that's what we're seeing. Oh. May I add to that? Just from an engineering standpoint, uh, so it's tough, but something here, a traffic study, we generally look at level of service. Will this new use affect the delays on the roadway? Um, and that's all based off the IT trip generation rates. And you're talking about uh, 2018 counts of about 18,000 vehicles per day on Mass Ave in this area. Uh, our projected increase is less than 1% of the total daily volume for our total daily max increase. I think the, the best, so you could do a full traffic study on the site drive and it may tell you that, you know, at some inflated number, if you want to use it, you might affect level of service and you should, you know, put in some sort of signal. I don't think that's prudent because what's going to happen is six months from now, you're going to say, why did I put this traffic light in? <laughs> it, it's, it's causing nothing but problems. Uh, I, I think that the best way to handle it is through a, a queuing management plan. Um, or an opening day high volume plan. Um, we've done that on a number of dispensaries where we work with public safety and said, okay, um, uh, April 20th is a 420 is a big marijuana holiday. Uh, so that's one that we kind of say, you know what, maybe we look at on these high volume days, let's, let's be forward thinking, have a plan set in place with the police department. We'll get a detail out here um, and have someone directing traffic uh, at either entrance. However, we like to leave that up to, to public safety. They know their job better. <coughs> Than, than we do. So we like to, to collaborate and work prior to opening and have that be a condition uh, to have a, a high volume management plan. And then the other part of those high volume management plans is to assess after you implement it, the first time, the second time, the hundredth time. What do we do right, what do we do wrong, and modify that plan going forward. So uh, can you just uh, walk us through how people will move from the parking lot into the facility, and then if people are queuing outside the facility, where that queue will be? So, uh, from the parking lot to the facility, would be behind the vehicles. Uh, we do have 24 feet in width, which is more than sufficient to get two cars to pass by, plus have a, a pedestrian walk, walking area. Uh, ideally, they would use the accessible route, uh, come up to the, the handicapped curb cut, and enter the facility, I believe the doors are over here, uh, where there's an interior queue that holds about 25 people plus up to an additional 40 people on the floor. Um, so you, you have a building that's going to handle about 65 people without any thought. And there's an occupancy limit of 105. Um, but our peak hour, we're looking at about 33 uh, customers. So they should all be able to, to stay within the building. But in these rare events, um, <coughs> what I would recommend in the queue plan would be to, to say, okay, we think we have a high volume event. Uh, we're gonna block off these two spots here and form a queue and then let people in through the back and walk around. I think restricting parking on site for a queue makes more sense than allowing additional parking and then having higher volume of traffic coming in uh, and then dealing with people who are trying to line up next to a building versus uh, this way you'd have a parking lot monitor that would you know, basically stop traffic, let people back and forth, uh, and kind of control yeah. it that way. And I, I will say, we worked on the, the Linway uh, project. The parking lot is nowhere near as friendly as this layout, um, and they've yet to have any, any issues on the Linway. And it is a, uh, you're, you're pulling back out onto a state highway, very limited backup space, it is a tight, tight driveway. Uh, people want to be in and out of there as quick as possible. Uh, I have uh, a couple of concerns. Uh, one is if people do end up queuing on the sidewalk, uh, how that affects accessibility for disabled customers uh, who, who might be trying to use the same sidewalk. 
Um, the other thing is if potentially during peak periods, uh, parking lots turning over three times an hour, um, the, uh, and, and having a significant number of entries and exits um, with somewhat um, limited <coughs> sight lines um, and a fair amount of pedestrian uh, traffic as, as well as vehicles on Mass Ave, I'm a little concerned about particularly pedestrian safety uh, from, from all the cars crossing the sidewalk going in and out, and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how you're thinking about that. Um, again, during a high volume situation, we would have security staff working as parking lot attendants. Uh, so while they wouldn't be directing traffic on the right of way, they would be stationed uh, at either entrance and exit. Uh, and then walk, watching for the pedestrians in the queue here. We would not want uh, a queue to form on the, the sidewalk next to the building or adjacent to the building. What we'd want to do is let them in in batches. Uh, like I said, if we had an exterior queue in that situation, again, we're, we're looking at twice the peak volume being capable of you know, being on the sales floor in the queue line. Uh, however, if we did exceed that, then we would go to a high volume plan you have someone main monitoring people here, probably some stanchions to, to keep them corralled, and then letting them cross, you know, we're gonna set five in at a time rather than this, this one and two. Uh, you can queue about two vehicles here where you can have someone standing to, yeah. to stop them, and then just watching them, the sidewalk. Uh, you know, something else we could do for, for long term is possibly a sensor that as a vehicle approaches here, uh, we could have a red light or something that says, uh, those are pretty short money. They're, they're photo sensors and just say yeah. uh, vehicle approaching. So someone walking down the sidewalk uh, would be able to see that way. Yeah, and, and I want to make sure that not only can the uh, entering and exiting vehicles see pedestrians on the sidewalk, but that the pedestrians can see uh, cars that may be coming uh, up the driveway. That, that, that's why I was mentioning the, the photo sensor back here. So as yeah. the vehicle pulls here, the light goes on. Yeah. Uh, showing the pedestrian that the, the cars come okay. uh, well well I am worried about the, the cars interacting with the pedestrians the pedestrians always tend to lose that battle so that's why yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, all right now um, so you, you're talking you mentioned your your I forget if you call it the high volume uh, plan open but, day plan high volume plan is um, so um, have you thought at all about off-site parking and where that might happen and uh, and how that would work, how you would get people uh, to the store? I'm going to defer to, to Joseph for that only because I'm, I'm strictly the engineer, uh, the, the logistics of the whole thing. Um, so we had off-site parking with transportation shuttles uh, for then opening day. We used it opening day for the first few hours and then stopped it. Um, it was quite unnecessary and we saw over 300 people that first day alone. Um, it's going to be a similar situation here. Not only do we have the 12 spots here, but there's within, let's say a tenth of a mile of the store. There's also a lot of street parking. And I truly believe based on our experience that just that parking lot alone will be enough for the, for the cars. Remember, when we're talking about all these customers and 33 per, per hour, that's, a, we're, we're talking about it assuming everyone drives, but not everyone's going to drive. Some people will take the, the bikes, some people will take the bus, which is a big bus stop right across the street. Some people will walk. There's pedestrian traffic in the area as well. Yeah, I, I think what we'd like to, to see is, uh, is flexibility. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you're, you're expressing that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we want to let you manage this um, in, uh, in a reasonable way and based on your experience with your other facilities and uh, also as things develop over time um, with this one. Um, but I think um, for our comfort, I think we'd like to see a more detailed plan uh, for, for how you're going to deal with opening day or, or other high volume situations specifically um, so that we understand, you know, where would off-site parking be, how would you handle shuttling people. Um, you know, I think we, we would like to see specifically um, more bike parking. Uh, so we'd like to see that on site both uh, on the exterior for customers and uh, I think your materials mentioned that uh, you were going to allow employees to bring their bicycles inside, but 
Um, we don't see any detail about what kind of indoor bike parking facility uh, is going to be available for them. Um, uh, I can provide that. And, and so I, I think what I'm driving at is, is more of a full transportation demand management plan that goes into more detail on, on all of this so that um, we understand how you're going to handle all of these issues. Um, you know, I, I think in the situation um, where things develop the way you, you believe they will, but also showing us that you've thought through how you're going to handle it if um, a, a more um, intensive situation does develop. Okay. And I think that might be all I have for the moment. Thanks, David. Go ahead, Jane. Thanks, good evening. I have a few general questions and then some more specific questions where I think your application doesn't have enough specificity in it and will need to be added. First general question, and maybe this was in here, maybe some of them are, and I missed it. Are you planning to close the Water Street facility? Yes. It is, so. Yeah, so basically one of the things that's part of our host community agreement is both locations will not be open simultaneously. Um, once this location is open, Water Street is closed, if not even a little sooner. Uh, we're still waiting to hear back from the state at what point in our change of location process they're gonna require us to close Water Street. So I've been waiting for about a month for a response, but you know, not even a peep. Talk about the staffing at the store. Sure. Um, at any given moment, we'll have a maximum of four adult use registers open and uh, one medical register open. The medical register will be open uh, at all times. Staffing would be one person for each of those registers. Uh, let's say one and uh, two shifts a day, but not full shifts. Uh, so there's a mid shift, uh, morning shift, evening shift, <coughs> but there's, there's spillover between us because we open from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, so you'll have five staff members manning the counters and um, one manager on duty, at least one security personnel at all times. Uh, you will have at least one of our agents on the actual sales room floor answering questions uh, as some customers and patients are looking around. Uh, and then we'll have one inventory manager at all times. So minimum when the facility is open is eight or nine? nine. Nine people, correct. Minimum when the facilities open. Maximum, maximum. You'll never have more than nine or less than nine. Uh, we might have less than it. So if we if we don't need all four registers, let's say Monday mornings between ten and twelve, you don't you're not you just don't have that much traffic. We'll open two adult use registers, for example. Um, I'll skip around a little bit sure. because that leads me somewhere we can intend to get to yet, which is if there are what twelve spaces. Mm -hmm. For parking, are you going to allow the employees to use the spaces? No. No? No, employees don't use our spaces in Lynn either. Um, there are a few town lots that they, that they could pay for parking and we reimburse them for. Uh, plus, we incentivize them to use public transportation or bicycles. Okay. Um, and, and that's something that we'd like to see laid out specifically in your TDM plan. Perfect. The, um, Yes, now I forgot what I was saying. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come back. It'll come back. Something else related, related to the um, parking. Oh, um, I think one of you mentioned that you will control the parking lot and the people using the Bank of America ATM will not use it. How are you going to prevent them from <coughs> driving and parking? Um, on, honestly, it's just by agreement, right now, by agreement with the landlord, who's the owner of. Uh, Swift to print as well. Um, if it becomes an issue, we'll look to start potentially with towing vehicles if needed. Or but you would have to have signage that says. Oh, there will be signage of possible parking only. Oh, all right, so we'll have, because it wasn't clear that mm -hmm. one of the things that was missing from this that I think would be helpful to yeah, have added. Just, just to add to that, I think we'd want to see where that apothecary only parking signage would be in your, in your plan. Okay. Perfect. Please, please. Um, has the Arlington Police Department reviewed your security plan? They have because it's the same security plan that we have at 11 Water Street. But have they reviewed this one for this location? Not this one specifically for this location, but it's kind of location agnostic. It's 
it, it would apply in this location the same as it applies in the Water Street location. And when we opened Water Street, we actually had, I think, almost every member of the PD come in for a tour uh, to see how everything <coughs> functioned, our security protocols, and things like that. Yeah, we, we, we would have a lot of meetings with, with, with uh, local PD. Okay. Um, one of the um, statements in your material is Apothka will have security agents on site as needed according to operational needs and requirements. Talk a little bit more about what that means. So during all open hours, we'll have at least one security agent um, outdoors, either walking the perimeter or checking, or checking IDs before customers walking through the front doors. Um, if it gets busier, if we have a certain time that is busier that we can see in the data, uh, or on a high volume day like April 20th, uh, open day, we would have also agents in the parking lot. And what's a security agent? What's the person's qualifications? What's the job description? Um, so, so far I can tell you that my favorite security agent that we have is actually former TSA. Uh, mm -hmm. She's great. Uh, she scares me to death. Um, <laughs> but in the friendliest of ways. Uh, but we're looking at people that could hold their own, defend themselves if there's ever any kind of confrontation. Um, and have had some kind of security experience in the, in the past. Do they wear uniforms? Do they have a badge? Talk they don't have a badge. Um, they're not, not police. Not, not a police badge. No, we, ha we have uh, Apothka reflective vests, mm -hmm. and you could clearly tell that they're security agents. It says security on it? Yeah, on the back, and then the, the Apothka logo. Um, for when it's cold, it's a big winter jacket. Uh, honestly, it's great. One of the things I would like to offer to everyone here is if you want a personalized tour of Lynn so you can see how that's functioning even from a security perspective. I have no problem doing that and also showing you our security features at our Water Street location. Um, your material says the director of security or a designated alternate will conduct regularly scheduled security checks of the facility. How often will those take place? Uh, at least once, once every 30 days. Okay, we'd be helpful to have that noted. That's and actually by regulation. So, um, so far it's either been myself or our director of security that's done those. And then once a year, we have to have an independent security company come in and do a full audit of everything. Yeah, I was going to ask that. Yeah, so, so that's, that's also by, yeah, that's also by regulations. But our monthly security checks go over every single point of uh, entry, making sure all key card uh, access is, is working properly, making sure every camera is clear of debris and functioning perfectly, and that we're recording more, at least 90 days worth of footage uh, from every single camera, and it, that it's insanely easily accessible. <coughs> It, the security audits, it says, goes to the commission. Correct. Um, have you talked to the Arlington Police about giving them a copy of the security audit also? I believe I sent it to the Board of Health. The Board of Health? Yeah. But mm -hmm. I have no problem but sharing that with At you. least one of those places in mm -hmm. either Board of Health or Police or both will get a copy of Correct. the security audit. And it's a very, <coughs> it's a very simple audit. It just <coughs> calls out every single security device that we have and whether it's functional or not. I can tell you this year's audit of not only our Arlington facility, but Lynn and our Fitchburg cultivation, um, we had 100%. The, the women's room and the men's room, is that for the public? Yes. And for staff, are they single occupancy? They are. Have you, have, have you given any thought to make them gender neutral instead of having one for men and one for women? I would have no issue with that. Just, that yeah. seems to be the way things are going yeah. these days. I just wondered. Um, you talk about giving employees subsidies for public transit. Can you talk about what that is? How you intend to? <coughs> do it? How do you intend to? Um, how much subsidy? How do you intend to make that a real incentive for them? Sure, I could tell you that. For example, some employees, uh, as we launched recreational in from Arlington. So the badging system here is a little weird. <coughs> We have to badge every single one of our employees uh, with CCC, and it's done by location. Uh, because of the timing of when we opened Arlington up, Arlington badges are tied to Fitchburg or as our cultivation. Um, every time, some employees here wanted to go out and work in the cultivation a little bit to help us prep for the, uh, the faster moving items and packaging the faster moving items. One of the things we did for them was every single time that any of them volunteered to go, we added $20 as a reimbursement to their next pay paycheck. For <coughs> so well, things here's an example of one place where I work. This is how they subsidize and incentivize. Everybody was entitled to a free bus pass, MBTA bus pass, monthly free. If you wanted the combo pass, you would just pay the difference mm -hmm. between the two. Uh, so that was one way. And I just wondered, 
you know, Absolutely. just other than saying, you know, if you have to go somewhere, I'll give you 20 bucks. How do you make this a regular thing so the <coughs> employees will say, sure, I'm going to take the bus because I get a free monthly bus pass. I think that so that's exactly a great idea, honestly. And that's something I have no problem with. Okay. Um, on, you, you had a nice page that showed lots of different trees. It was not clear to me where the trees are going, which trees are going where. Have you made that decision yet? I know I saw, I saw that with little green blobs, but so, talk about that some more. Uh, we left it a little open. Um, depending on the aesthetics, uh, hopefully some conversations with the neighbors. Uh, we've, we've provided a list of plants that are suitable for the area, uh, but we can, we'd like to be able to pick and choose from, from that list as far as, uh, you know, the, the larger, uh, item here, that's a large deciduous tree. Um, there's a number of them, uh, red maple, sugar maple, uh, uh, hickory, they're all, they're all hardy trees in the zone. Uh, we did try to keep them fairly, fairly open to, to allow us to confer with the neighbors. We'll see what my colleagues think, but I think I'd be interested in seeing a more detailed planting plan with what's going. We could identify those as well as the, uh, well, we have a caliper size, but we could, we could specify, uh, the, the plants per mm -hmm. simple, but uh, the intent is to to vegetate this as much as possible with some, uh, some nice uh, landscape trees. Okay. Um, bicycle parking. We just adopted, or the, the town meeting just adopted the bicycle parking bylaw in the last session, which we <coughs> wrote basically. And as I read it, you're required by the bylaw to provide parking, minimum of two short-term spaces and minimum of two long-term spaces. Long-term spaces are intended to be for employees. Short-term spaces are intended to be for people who bicycle up to use, you know, or buy things, or whatever they're gonna do here. Facilities, so I think for that, you may need more, depending on what your traffic management plan, demand plan turns out to be, but as I read the bylaw, as a minimum, you need two of each, and the two for the employees are supposed to be inside or protected by the weather in some way. So you can look at the bylaws so, and see what the requirements are. And there's now also, the town also has a bicycle guide, which will help with that. Uh, we haven't seen the, the comment come uh, on staff review, and then uh, hearing you speak a little bit before the meeting, right. I stole your thunder there a little bit, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, okay. the, uh, this area here, I, I think we can fit um, two side-by-side -side racks to have four exterior, and then we'll, we'll denote inside where we intend to, to allow two, two bicycle spaces for employees. That uh, would be interior. Uh, they would, it'd just basically be a storage area for them. It wouldn't be anything fancy like a full locker for the bicycles. That would be clear people. Yeah, I think on that, I think we can take a look at the, the guide that the town yes. now has on what's required for indoor and outdoor bicycle park. Um, so, so traffic, people have talked a lot about traffic. I don't wanna say um, too much other than, I think we do need to send this to someone else to take another look at it. Maybe it should be the town's traffic advisory committee. I, I just don't see a real correlation with the square footage of the facility and the amount of traffic that you're gonna get for the facility, and I thought it was a little odd that the traffic study was based on the square footage of the facility and not um, what other facilities are in the area, the population demographics, population density, things like that. So I have real, and as you pointed out, there's not a lot of data on this. So I don't, I don't know where to go with that other than I think we need to have somebody else take a look at it. I'm sort of a little unclear about um, what somebody does. They drive up and there are like two or three cars waiting to get in to the parking lot. And let's say that there are no, all the spaces are full. How do they know that? Where do they go next? Um, once, they, once they pull in, if all the spaces are full, they, they're going to be required to exit. And then uh, most likely they would then search for on-street parking is, is the next logical step. I mean, that's, that's generally how, whenever I'm in a, a semi-urban area looking for parking, 
if I can get the free on-site parking, I'm going for that first, and then I'm going to meeting spots afterwards. Um, but the, the idea is to keep people moving and not loitering. Uh, I did see a comment about uh, anti idling and we will make sure we have signage uh, depicted that, that states the, the anti idling laws, idling access in five minutes, I believe is, is a 250 dollars fine now. But we'll, we'll reference the, the mass code so people are aware. Is it possible, and, and I, I mention this because if you're driving up, you don't know if the spaces are available or not. Is it possible to put something there so that if the spaces are full, it says spaces are full, don't come in? During high volume, we would have some station there to wait people past the line, we just uh, not let them in. Uh, during the everyday uh, usage, um, it, it'd be very difficult to to get parking sensors that would work accurately without uh, extreme expense. The, the best ones usually work by weight. Uh, the, the ones that work out the photo sensors work great right inside a garage, but then once you start getting snow banks, they, they show the spots full all the time. So the anticipation then is that the security agent, when all the spaces are full, will go up to only during high, high during high volume when there's multiple security yeah. agents on staff. Uh, the the idea would be uh, one or two would be dedicated as parking lot attendants during high volume to to keep the parking lot moving and control them. Um, but otherwise. Just like trader tips. Yeah. The spots are full, the spots are full. But you can see the spots. Well, maybe you go ahead building in those spots. Well, the snow is the next thing I wanted to mention. So it snow would be removed as quickly as possible? How, it's not going to be just piled up in a couple of the spaces. It's going to be actually removed. Tell, talk the, about that. The idea is that during light snows, uh, we have a small area here. Um, and the other idea was, was this kind of corner here for your you know, hop-in snowstorm when you, uh -huh. you clear the lot. Once you get any sort of uh, heavily accumulated snow, just like any urban area, uh, you'd have a contract with the landscaper who would come in, uh, pile them onto a dump truck, and they would take it off for, for proper disposal. So you're not going to have it just piled up in part of the park? No, it's, it's in our best interest to keep as many spaces clear as possible, too, for success. And we have that kind of contract right now in Lynn. Uh, mm -hmm. Last winter, I know I should make it was an easy winter, but uh, the few times that it was a lot of snow, they were there that morning early. Does, does the police department at the Water Street facility now have a point of contact? Yes. That they can call if there's a question, et cetera, and they have the same thing? Yes. Here a security contact? Correct. Um, they, they all have my phone number personally, uh, as well as our director of security. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, you mentioned you're going to put on the catch basins. Talk about that a little bit. Yes, so uh, <coughs> the existing catch basins look like they could use some maintenance. We would go in with the before opening uh, the back of the truck, clean out any accumulated sediment. Um, I did not see uh, hoods. Uh, what they are, the gas traps. So they're basically like a T that fits down below the, the sump line, and that way uh, grease oil all floats up on top and isn't able to get out. Uh, that would bring them to to somewhat comply in catch basin standards. Uh, I wasn't able to fully measure the sump to see if they complied with the four foot sump, but uh, this would improve uh, stormwater quality exiting the site and then you're gonna right. capture hydro count. Have you thought about putting in deep sump catch basins as long as you're there already doing things? There was thought to it. It runs into issues with who owns the catch basins. Uh, one of them straddles the property line. This is a, a state highway, and if we could avoid dealing with mass highway on their drainage structures, we would like to in all ways possible. I, I think, I mean, I think as long as you're going to be doing things with them, if it's possible for you to it's a, create we, a deep We can inquire, but we don't want to get into a situation where we're dealing with mass highway. But I, under, I understand, but if it's possible easily, I think it would help um, to do that along with the gas oil separators. I think those would be good. Yeah, we'll make our, our best attempt at it. That's, uh, I'll call Public Works and see if, if they can help us. Uh, you might also want to look into <coughs> a possible ledge there. Uh, that's, uh, that's on that hill that sort of goes up. That's like all ledgy stuff. So uh, luckily, 
The limited disturbance is no closer than the current one. However, there are some, some little landscape islands that, that come out. Uh, so any ledge removal that we hit would be just eight, 12 inches down to get um, sufficient gravel. Well, I was talking more about the deep uh, uh, catch basin itself, it, not the you can, flattens. You can still be compliant with deep sump catch basins by going to a, to a wider diameter sump. Instead of deeper, it's, it's all a volume the yep. equation. It's just four feet is the, the standard, but we can go to three foot fixed up in the, the capture area. But also, you said you have that uh, sort of pseudo rain guard that's going to reduce the uh, yeah, so amount of flow by quite a bit. Yeah, and, and that would improve, uh, you know, on the less frequent storms, that would improve uh, TSS removal rate significantly. Correct. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Richard. Thank Great, you. thanks. Um, just had a couple of questions for you that um, haven't been covered yet. Um, I'll start with the building itself. So I noticed that you're moving the entrance from, right now you enter Swifty from the vestibule to the street facade itself. I don't see any details on the entry itself. Are you looking at swing doors, um, sliding doors? What Can you give me some more details? Yeah, double doors. Similar. Okay, great. And just full glass or what, what, um, so what are would, the details? So it's, um, it would be similar to what we already have. It's, it's glass but with metal framing. Okay. And it has a locking mechanism that could be unlocked or off. Okay, great. I think it would just be good to have a couple details on, on sure. your storefront modifications. Um, even if it's to match existing, uh, that would be helpful for sure. us to see. Um, in terms of the, the signage, I know that you are only permitted modest signage here. Can you give me those some details on what the sign actually is? Is it lit? What materials? Colors? Sure. So our logo is gray. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would be our logo with the name of Pothka underneath it. Um, we're we going with steel cut, and it will be LED backlit, but the backlighting doesn't turn on until 30 minutes before uh, before the, uh, the night, and it turns off once we close. Um, again, if we could just have a, a few more sign details on the package for record, that would be, that would be helpful. Um, the other thing is when you do remove the Swifty printing sign, which is up on the on the building, you're gonna need to be mindful of repair of, of that facade and you know um, taking care of be some discoloration and other mm -hmm. items. We really want to make sure the building facade um, looks like it's been well cared for as opposed to just mm -hmm. pulled off. Well, and even on the facade front, uh, there's one piece that isn't actually concrete where they put an air intake, mm -hmm. as well as there's some wood that's kind of faded. Both those are being already repaired. As it would be great to have some notation of that on the, on the elevations if you could, please. Perfect. Great. Um, the next question I had, um, just, just out of curiosity, your business hours, are those going to be similar to your Lynn location where it's every day 8 to, uh, 10, to 10, 8. 10 to 8, rather? Correct. Okay, great. And it's in compliance with the protocol. Super. Um, one question that hadn't been covered on the landscaping, um, the uh, small planting strip that you have directly behind the building, kind of where that um, old uh, teller window is, et cetera, you're right there. What, just, but just that thin strip behind there, what's your intent of how to actually use use that? Are you going to plant anything there? Are you going to do gravel? Yeah. Ideally, we'd go with some sort of decorative grass. Just okay. kind of the thought. Yeah. There's not a lot of room there right. for roots to grow. Decorative grass right. looks nice, maybe some, some stone, although we're, we're talking about using that now for a rain garden, so mm -hmm. that may uh, engage some sure. of that, yeah. and it would probably just be uh, grassy swale instead of uh, decorative grass. Just want to make sure again that doesn't just look like a forgotten. Um, oh, so the the, the cross hatching, I, I apologize, uh, is supposed to correspond with this area of uh, uh, ground plantings of, okay. of various bulbs and Great. Uh, decorative branches. Okay. Um, what, looking at your at your site plan um, and just knowing a couple of the issues, the bigger issues that they've run into at the Brooklyn location, one of them is. Both of them, I think, have to do with this rear parking lot. And in my mind, one of them is is trash. You know, the, the intake slips that people get. Um, you know, the, I just hear that a lot of the issues that the surrounding neighbors have really have to do with with litter people coming out of the facility. So, whether you're able to incorporate any kind of a um, waste receptacle on the way out to the cars, perhaps over by the um, where you have the the equipment pad, which is something to to look into. And then the other issue, sorry, please go ahead. Uh, again, based on the last on the experience we've had, it hasn't been an issue in Lynn. Um, and obviously, we're looking at a parking lot on a daily, multiple, multiple times a day to make sure it looks nice and clean. 
we have not had, security, yeah. Yeah, we have not had any kind of litter issues there, thankfully. Great. Um, another, and this probably plays into the question of, you know, how often will your security guard actually be in the parking area as opposed to mm -hmm. inside the, the building? Um, you know, another issue that they've had a lot there is consumption within the cars and, you know, then the loitering um, once people have left the, the building. So how will your security guard deal with, with those types of issues? So you, you finish your transaction, you're in your car, mm -hmm. getting them out and moving. So first of all, our security guard is never actually inside. They're always, so they're fully outside. They're always outside. Okay. Um, if it's really, really down for, then they'll be just on the inside of the door, yep. worst case scenario. Um, but loitering is not allowed. They have access to the cameras, so if they need to be able to, if they, they're always watching the, yep. the parking lots, no matter what. Um, and that's multiple people within the store that have that access. Um, if anyone's seen loitering, we tell them to move if they don't comply, or if anyone at all violates uh, public consumption laws, yep. um, or appears to be getting high and then driving, mm -hmm. um, that gets reported. Okay, so you do have security cameras on the back of the building oh, yeah. and monitoring. We see everything. Perfect. Um, Just on that last comment, yeah. we see everything, but we will not point it at neighbors' properties. <laughs> um, one more on the parking lot. Um, we had talked a little bit before about the difficulty. So, you know, taking a drive behind the, the space um, this weekend as I was preparing for this, that right turn is, is tough. You know, you, you come right up. So I think your idea, again, of having a, a sensor and, and letting the pedestrians know that a, a car is exiting, especially with the increased frequency, is something that I, I think I'd be interested in, in you guys taking a look at. I'm sure that's a tough, mm -hmm. tough intersection there. Um, another question I had is about deliveries and loading. Um, given, again, the um, expectation of the amount of traffic, I would assume that those are going to be pretty high value spots right in front of the, the street parking, right in front of your, your building as well. So how are you planning on dealing with um, deliveries? You mentioned that there was special trash pickup. Um, are those before hours, during hours, and how do those work? It's completely randomized. Sec for security reasons, okay. I can't go into too many details, but the routes taken, the days delivered, the times delivered are completely randomized. And the best I could do on that one, I'm sorry, I can't be more, go into more details, is it hasn't been an issue thus far, ever. Can you, are you, okay. Um, <laughs> It's a, it's a bad so, answer. No, no, I understand. Can you talk to where they drop? Are you planning on taking deliveries in the front through the side entrance? Can you talk to that at that, all? Will that they will go also, through the parking? That will also be randomized. Okay. Uh, sometimes it'll be from the side entrance, sometimes mm -hmm. it'll be directly from the front entrance. Again, just we don't want right. to I understand. any kind of uh, pattern. Can you talk about whether these are vans versus trucks? They are uh, small, so what we use is a small uh, Nissan MV cargo van. Yep. Um, it kind of fits the same space as a small SUV. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's insanely secure. So there's three locks to get into the back. Yep. Uh, the traditional trunk lock, a secondary lock that's put on mm -hmm. the outside, and then when we open it up, steel cages with a third lock. Um, there's also segregation from the drivers to the back with another steel cage. The side door does not open, it's bolted shut. There are cameras looking out from the inside and looking in from the doorway, so the inventory is always under camera. And there's a built-in GPS unit um, which tracks uh, where it's going, speed, um, and if there's any unscheduled stops, which we will sure. immediately report. So so my, if I may just please, add, uh, a lot of the stuff Joseph's uh, bringing up is required through the CCC. Mm -hmm. So the routes are randomized and logged through CCC. The DVA, any deviation from the route, uh, they have a few minutes to call or else they'll send cruisers out looking for them if the, the vehicle deviates off that. Right. So, so my questions have less to do with that and more, but more to do with the safety within the parking lot if you have a van parked within the parking lot in terms of people coming in and out, pedestrians coming in and out, and then also for, you know trying to get, make sure that we're not gonna be having double parking, if the spot's in front, again, if you're randomized and you need to be mm -hmm. moving your routes, how are you going to ensure that uh, if all the spots in the front are, are taken, you're gonna be able to, to make your drop off? So uh, those are more my questions. How sure. are you going to deal with um, the parking lot? And maybe that's something, again, in your traffic, um, well, so in your traffic plan that you might wanna. So the store is alerted about 30 minutes to an hour before mm -hmm. the van arrives. So they take the 
lo locally, they take the right precautions to make sure one spot is available at all times for them. So they, your, your employees will physically go out and block off yeah. a parking spot, assuming that they're able to catch one when it turns over. Correct. And, and depending on the day, it, will, it might be one of our own spots, or it could be one of the street parking spots. Okay. And I'm assuming that that's something, again, if you're going to be regularly blocking off parking, that you would speak with and coordinate with the Army team. 100%. Okay. Just make sure I caught everything. Questions from members of the board before I turn it over to oh, I'm sorry. the public. Sorry, I went over there. Went over there. Right. Uh, you know, assuming that you know, you're, you're probably going to need to you know return back because we had a couple other questions. Um, just take another look at the lead checklist that, that you use. The existing buildings is is really not the, the right checklist for this group. It should be either the commercial interiors or a lead for retail. That was really meant for um, larger buildings that building managers take a look at. So if you could do that, that would be great. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so, thank you all for your patience. I'm sure <coughs> many of you that want to speak, uh, I did have uh, beginning at I noticed that there's a sign-in sheet. So I am just going to run down the sign-in sheet. If you sign in in, uh, in error, just pass. Uh, I'm not going to play any favorites or any preferences here tonight. Uh, I will ask you to come forward, use the microphone, state your name and address, uh, and we will uh, begin. So first on the list is Laura Larkin. Uh, Josephine Burton. So name and address, please. I already Just, said your name, but just for the record, we yes, your address. Yes, I'm Josephine Burton. My address is 71 Paul Revere Road. Um, the person, the, the house, um, one of the neighbors right here behind. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the panel. Um, you, I feel like you addressed a lot, a lot of the questions I had that I didn't think of. But one of the main questions, um, talking about trees, um, adding to the landscape, um, one of my big concerns is right now, whoever owns this property, they put a fence in. <laughs> they did not do a good job. First of all, they never told us when they were gonna remove the fence, they just showed up in our lawn uh, one day, pulled out, yes, pulled the fence out, and they said it, they were going to replace it. Mm -hmm. um, it. It took a while because this happened, I think, around this time, um, and then the ground got frozen. So, okay, I understand the ground was frozen and so forth. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, they came to place the fence and they said, there's gonna be a space. So they never, the, whoever decided to put the fence in, whatever company, um, there's gonna be a space. Okay, sure. No, the space is quite high, like this. So one of my concerns now is like, all right, I, if this passes through, What's going to happen? Um, you know, I'm used to Swifty Printer, who are very quiet neighbors. Um, so that's one of my main concerns. And also, lighting uh, is going to disturb my. Sorry, I have a tickle in my throat. Um, disturb my. My bedroom, just where my bedroom is. I, I look at Swifty um, from my bedroom. So that's another of my concerns but um, that I can think of. And then, um, again, when they start building the noise and so forth. Okay. <laughs> I think there's water. Thank you. Yeah. Can, can yep. we ask them 
to address the lighting in the parking lot? Yes. Yeah, I was about, sure. I was about it to say to Gene. It doesn't go over into the neighbors. Yeah, and also uh, tell us a little bit more about how we've asked for a fleshed out landscaping plan and uh, what you'll be doing, if anything, with the fence that's there. So. Uh, I'll address the lighting first because that's the easiest one that I can answer right off the top of my head. Uh, as far as lighting effects on the abutting properties, it, that was the uh, spillover that we talked about. Um, crossing the property line, you're, you're talking about a tenth of a candle foot, uh, which is equivalent if you lit a candle and stood 10 feet away from it, it's the same uh, amount of light. So it's very, very little light spill over. And these lights shut off as a half hour after you close or so? Or? With it, yeah. Basically, after employees leave, the lights are off. So they're all, on. The, all the exterior cameras uh, are night vision cameras. So about 30 minutes after everyone leaves, there's a time to set. So 8.30 at night, they will all be off. Um, and they're all dark sky compliant, which means that you can't see the actual physical element of the light. So when you look at it, you'll see the light emitted, but you won't be able to see, kind of like uh, the ceiling lights here, in that they're up, uplit, and you, you can't see from down below, so you turn your eyes. Very similar. Uh, well, I, don't, I don't mind seeing the element per se. It's just that is it going to shine in? Very, so I think I think <coughs> these are all down. They all face the park. Correct. They don't face out to your bedroom window. Like. And they're all full cut off. Correct. Full, full cut off. Dark sky. That is that might help. So full cut uh, yeah, full cut off light. Uh, the light is faced like this. There are uh, shields that go around all three sides because these are building mounted lights on, on your side. Uh, so those shields uh, basically force that light uh, more downward than, than in the spread. Um, and like I said, the, the spillover at the property line, and this is assuming the level of ground, uh, you're much higher. Uh, it's a tenth of a candle foot, or looking at a candle from a distance of 10 feet is approximately the same. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not it, it, it's, it's not a spotlight if you die, by any okay. right? <laughs> yeah. uh, As far as the fence, uh, you know, as I said, uh, we did want to talk to some of the abutters and get some planting preferences. I think this is a, a, a good time. I can provide you with a business card if you don't mind reaching out. And, um, we can discuss uh, possibly uh, repairing the fence or improving how it was installed and uh, providing some, some additional buffer uh, landscape plantings to, to assist in your, um, your situation. It might look fine. It might look fine from the Swifty parking lot, but it looks Awful from no, my, my side. From your side. Why don't you have a conversation with this gentleman after the meeting's over? I think they'll mm -hmm. be receptive to what you have to say. Okay. Uh, Chris Loretti, next on the list. Uh, could you come back for me? Can you, I'm just going in order, Mr. Loretti. All right, I didn't sign up anymore. I signed up because it was here. I didn't sign up to be Do you want to what? speak now or do you want to speak? Uh, Wait, I, I, I called his name. I don't want to. I told you I'm not going to play favorites. Or not? I'm gonna, not going to play favorites. I've called your name. I'm going in order to be fair to everyone. I didn't sign up in New York, sir. Thank you. Chris Loretti, 56 Adam Street. Um, I'd like to address this question of giving up a parking space for one tenant to another tenant. Uh, if indeed that bank or bank ATM machine needs a parking space, I've never heard of a tenant being able to um, say that the zoning bylaw doesn't apply and there is now no longer any required parking for that use. Um, if there is a required parking space for that ATM machine that's required and they have no business and nobody else is in business suggesting that it's not required. So I think that's something that the board needs to look into. I'm not saying it is required, I don't know, but certainly if it is, then this use doesn't uh, get to use that parking space for themselves. Uh, my next comment pertains to um, the parking situation. I appreciate that it's been brought up, the issue of um, loading and unloading. And I think in this parking study, parking plan, there needs to be some explicit discussion about how there will be no uh, double parking on Mass Ave. It's a very busy place. If this is a business that's primarily a, primarily a cash business, there are going to be um, armored trucks coming in and out. And um, typically, those things just double park in the street. I think there needs to be you know, some explicit consideration of preventing that uh, in whatever plan is done. Um, I would also note regarding the queuing 
And this was, there's a story published in the online edition of the Boston Globe tonight. I'm not sure it's been in the paper edition yet. But there, there's a one article being submitted in Brookline to require the um, marijuana facility there to operate on an appointment basis only. Um, obviously, it's not something that's very popular, popular by the off, uh, for the, with the operators. Though I believe that was done in Salem when that shop initially opened. I think that's something the board might want to consider. It is not actually imposed, and at least right into the special permit, that you have the power to require appointment only um, should you know, problems arise once the facility opens. Uh, my next comment pertains to the open space. And I turn your attention to the application that the, um, uh, the applicant submitted. When I first looked at this, it looked like there was a required minimum of 20% open space, and they were only providing about 14.5% open space, and therefore were non-compliant. Um, as I looked at it, I realized that that's not correct. They're actually lower compliant. And this gets back to a request that I made to your board several months ago to um, put that clarification back in the zoning bylaw where it belongs, and that is that the open space requirement is based on the floor area, not the lot area. They calculated it based on the lot area incorrectly, and that's why it looks like it's, um, it's non-compliant, and in fact it is. I realize the form itself says GFA, but it doesn't explain that, and it really should be in the bylaw. Um, finally, I also want to note, I appreciate that someone's mentioned the buffer area behind the parking lot and also the fence. The bylaw um, explicitly specifies that the neighbors can um, discuss with the developer, or, or in this case, the, uh, the applicant, what the nature of that fence is and uh, whether the five to six feet is bylaw requires or something different. Um, I think you might want to formalize that more broadly than just with the one person who showed up here tonight. I believe there's several property owners behind the uh, behind the structure who may want to be involved in that conversation as well. But I would certainly encourage you to, um, uh, to facilitate that if not require it. So I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Timothy Castle. Uh, Linda Langdon. Linda Langdon, 78, Paul Bergeer Road. Um, I basically just want to thank the board for discussing the parking issue and the traffic issue and ask that if there is going to be another study that the Paul Revere neighbors be notified or at least have access to that study. Um, one of the things I've noticed is that if I, let's say I'm, I'm on my Saturday morning errands, and I want to start with Citizens Bank. So I, I might drive there, I know I can walk there, but let's say I want to go elsewhere. So I'll drive to Citizens Bank, and Mass Ave is backed up uh, practically to the Trader Joe's parking lot. So what I do is I go to my Citizens Bank, and instead of staying on Mass Ave, I'll turn around and I go up for Revere. And I think what a lot of us are concerned about is that's exactly what's going to happen. Our Paul Revere is going to be the cutoff. So I don't know what scope the, this traffic study can encompass. But if Paul Revere could be included somehow, you know, even we as, we as neighbors have met and said, you know, even if there's um, a one way, you know, like they do on Lake Street or off Lake Street, you know, put one way hours in or something like that. Just because I think at, first of all, at, you know, just um, traffic time, school starts when, when people are trying to get to work and we're going to have a high volume anyway because we are a cutoff. And I'm just concerned. Have, do we really know how this is going to impact the traffic on Paul Revere? So it's it's a personal thing for us. Um, the yeah. other thing, I'm Can I sorry. Ask a question: When when during the day is there that long traffic backup? Does it tend to be morning, afternoon, evening? When is it? I, for me, uh, morning rush hour. So it's and, and even then, so it's rush hour. Let's say Monday through Friday. 
Um, it's more pronounced in the morning. Right, because when I, when I drive by later on in the day, it's backed up a little bit from Park Avenue, but not nearly back to the Trader Joe's. Yeah. I think even yeah. rush hour, too, is, is back. Yeah. I would say yeah, but I would say the morning is, is yeah. heavier, but they're both. So open. I think <clears throat> with respect to morning rush hour, they're, they won't be open until 10 o'clock. Yes. But I would certainly share your concern with the evening rush hour, since they're open until 8 on the other end, uh, particularly on weekends. I, I live not far from there. I spend a lot of time stuck in traffic on Mass Ave myself. Yeah. Uh, and mostly, I think it's because of the light at Mass Ave and Park Ave. But I think we can ask the Transportation Advisory Committee to weigh in on that and propose some potential solutions if possible. That'd be awesome. And 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 also, um, Saturday morning, just shopping. You know, um, I think Saturday morning is when you've got, you know, people trying to get to Trader Joe's or the banks or, you know, whatever. So Saturday morning mm -hmm. seems to be a time to I think the other thing, again, um, more to me to probably here than anything else, is the fact that some of us don't have a driveway. And what we're concerned about, as Joe said, um, if people circle Mass Ave and they can't find parking, they're going to look for non-metered parking. And Paul Revere is you know, one of the more convenient, you, you can come up park and you can turn on Paul Revere. Now, I, one thing, I don't know, this is not the time or place, but I think we need more no parking signs on the, the side of the road that's headed west toward Lexington. But I think what's going to happen is that people are going to be parking, or again, I don't know, but what we're concerned about is that people are going to be parking on Paul Revere. And I know for a fact, some of our neighbors come home from work at 6, you know, 6.30, and they have their parking place in front of the house. Everybody kind of knows that. You know, we all respect that. Well, you know, that's, not so, that's something that we're not going to be able to control now. So I think I just, you know, for the benefit of, of me and my neighbors, that's, I just, I do want to thank everybody for working for all your information. Thank you. I think one of the things that we'd like to see as part of a transportation demand management plan is how you're going to control where people park in the neighborhood, <clears throat> on Paul Revere specifically, but throughout, I think. Uh, keeping, with, as best you can within your power of understanding that. Uh, identifying alternate parking sites that aren't affecting the people who live right behind your facility is, is good. Um, if you have any, any opportunity to do a co-parking arrangement with either uh, the building immediately to the right where the butcher and the side of the VR, that parking lot is frequently not full. I don't know if you've had a chance to talk with the landlord there and see about some sharing arrangement uh, or further down. It's not going to happen. We're okay. Worth the conversation. <laughs> if it I, I, I just want to add that the thing that they can definitely control is to tell their employees who are driving not to park on Paul Revere Road. 100%. Right? So I think, I'm not sure where they're going to park, but they need to park in places that are sensitive to the residents. Well, there's even more that we could, a little more that we could do. Um, so there's act, we could actually have an acknowledgement form for all new customers. Um, so that, that they could acknowledge, you know, please don't park on Paul par Revere and any other things that's important to the neighborhood. Um, and it's something we could also post on our website. A lot of people Google us first and they actually go into our website when we launched in Lynn. Our traffic that first day, I think, was like 6,000 visitors. And we very clearly outlined what we're doing about Paul Revere. <coughs> and that's something that we would obviously do here. And any restrictions like this, we would blast on our website and through our newsletter when we announce the opening. And employees, because they would oh, employee, that, that, that goes without saying. Employees will, yeah. will definitely know that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Keith Schneebly. Apologize if I butcher anybody's name. Hi, uh, Keith Schneebly, 17 with Count Road, Arlington. I am a member of the Tree Committee, which um, is actually my question. I didn't prepare for this, but I noticed that you do have a planting plan and you were curious about um, what you were going to put there. It wasn't entirely clear. There is a tree warden and there are some preferred plantings. That, so there might be references, uh, other groups in town too. I think there's a garden committee as well. If you want to get in touch with those folks. That'd be great. Yeah, we could help suggest what you 
might want to play it there. If possible, can you give us your contact information? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I think the Detroit Committee is a good resource. Um, there are a lot of good volunteers there. It's the Detroit Warden, Conservation Commission. You can all sort of point you in the right direction. Uh, <clears throat> and last name on my list is William Rockwood. That's me. Thank you. Thank you. Waiting. Thank you. Um, I guess my first question is. Name and address, um, please. Oh, yes. My name is Bill Rockwood. I live at 71 Paul Revere Road, um, in the lower unit. And uh, I guess my first question is, um, are you going to do something about the rats that are living in um, under the juniper bushes in the back of that uh, parking lot? So part of the landscaping plan was ripping out the existing landscaping and landscaping it with new, clean looking landscaping. Um, I prefer to use like a river rock or a wash stone as a base. Mm -hmm. uh, in the food industry, that helps to stop the rats from uh, inhabiting uh, the, the area. They don't like to borrow in the, in the stone. Um, I would assume that if there's a rat problem, we would put out traps and have hire a pest uh, company to remove that. We do sell a, or Apotheca does sell a food product in, in edibles. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want any rat infestation out there. So if there is a rat problem out there, currently there will not be one uh, in the future. If, if there is, you're gonna be shocked. No, that's, uh, so like I said, Tony will be responsible for that. <laughs> uh, re removing those low-lying junipers, uh, however, with this new information, I think we would contact the pest control company first, mm -hmm. try and trap and dispose of any rodents that are out there before we disturb them to, to minimize impacts with the neighbors. And I, I think uh, Fox would be more than willing to coordinate that with the neighbors as well so we know what's going on in the neighborhood. If there's complaints, we can get the pest control to expand there. That's, that's good. I, I appreciate that because dealing with the, the landlord directly is unpleasant at best. So thank you for that. Um, right. Uh, let's see here. I guess I, I wanted to reiterate the um, I'm worried about the impact of Paul Revere and I wish the traffic study could um, take into um, into account what uh, the increased traffic is going to be on Paul Revere Road because you know, there's an existing problem and I can only imagine that this increased traffic is going to make it worse. Um, and uh, yeah, this, if this, you're going to do a study, please look at the impact on Paul Revere. Um, and I, I, I don't, um, this is not, I guess, probably the proper forum for it, but I guess better traffic enforcement on Paul Revere would mitigate a lot of these problems. You've probably got some juice with the cops that I don't have, so you know you could uh, you could you know have a word with them. That that would make us a lot more comfortable with, with you being there. We'll do our best. I promise. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wants to speak that I can call on that maybe missed the list? All right. Thank you. Um, I'll leave it to my colleagues to comment, but just based on what we're hearing now, I think what we'd like to do most likely. Um, Continue the hearing. Uh, I think the next available date we have is December. I mean, if, if you're doing a traffic but study and consulting with many other parties, probably, probably December 16th or January. I think January would be preferable to us, but we can. December 16th would be fine if you think you're ready to go that. Yeah. It's either okay. December 2nd or December 16th. Yeah. So, the so what I have here is we need a uh, more detailed parking plan, traffic management plan, transportation management, demand management plan, uh, bike parking. We need to see a more descriptive lighting plan, especially with respect to the parking lot in the back, and uh, what we'll work on as far as uh, the Mass Ave sidewalk lighting controls. Uh, fleshed out landscape plan with a discussion with uh, some of the other stakeholders in town about how that goes. Uh, and I strongly encourage you to have a conversation with the folks here who came to speak this evening. Uh, I really appreciate all of you weighing in and bringing in some good ideas, uh, especially about the fence, the trees, and how, uh, I know you're not doing construction here, so we don't have that concern to worry about with, with uh, impact on the neighbors. But certainly with how your landscaping changes will impact them, uh, particularly with the gentleman up front here said about the vermin that inhabit the parking lot. I know you'll take care of that. Uh, I'm also going to recommend 
the traffic study you provided be referred to the Transportation Advisory Committee, uh, that they weigh in and give us an opinion on that, uh, as well as considering the impact of this use on uh, Paul Revere Road and the intersection at Mass Ave and Park Ave, in their opinion, as to the impact of uh, on street parking and the, the burden on that. And again, um, you know, meet with the folks that are here this evening, we have time. Uh, we do have some additional business to attend to, but once we set you free, there's plenty of space on this building that you can work with. I'm sorry, yeah. can I? Go we, ahead. We had a couple other things that I um, oh, yeah. requested that I want to make sure that we see at the next bill. Some more detail on the building facade mm -hmm. modifications, and the signage would be great as well, please. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the revised the checklist. And the storm, storm management. And, 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 and the catch basin. And the yeah, stormwater management. Stormwater management on the park a lot. And, and I think we want Excuse to, me? I just wanted to ask a question. Please. To, to Go the, ahead. Uh, is it okay if we reach out to the Transportation Advisory Council ourselves too to, to explain? Yeah, Jenny will coordinate that. All right, thank you. Just because I, I think that's going to be the, the, the biggest task that we have. So. Yeah, yeah. The staff, Jenny, will coordinate that with thank the you. members of the TAC and make sure that that conversation is had quickly and productively. Thank you very much. Do you have anything? Yes. Else? Okay. <laughs> So in addition to those things, actually, I'd like to um, refer your security plan to the Arlington Police Department, and I'd actually like them to make re uh, recommendations in terms of the level of police details um, that are required for the site and how you might manage that lot and how they might also address the issues that I also have observed on Paul Revere Road, even though I don't live there. Um, I've certainly gone by there at various times of day when I think you will have peak demand based on locations where I'm aware of there being peak demand beyond just the time that you noted in your study. <coughs> um, so I'd really like the police department to be able to confirm that demand and also make some recommendations about how to control some of the traffic issues, not just existing, but projected ones. Um, I'd also like to add to that um, how they might, uh, your proposal in terms of police detail for that first sort of exciting month, if you will, and the, uh, the dates that might be exciting to people who tend to go to the facility, I don't think that that's going to be enough. And I think that you're gonna to have to use some combination of both the Arlington Police Department as well as your own security in order to manage the demand. Um, the reality is that this is the, going to be the first facility open west, you know, western suburb um, and in location to, in, in relationship to locations that don't have will not have any permanent marijuana facilities. So there will be a demand that I don't think you're accounting for, which I think we've covered pretty clearly this evening. Um, so I think the Arlington Police Department is actually pretty key in this. And then and picking up off of where you're, you have been very successful in your current location, it's very different, the location that you're proposing to go to. And I think that respecting the neighborhood and respecting particularly the abutters on Paul Revere Road is really important. Um, and then lastly, uh, the Board of Health, I think starting the conversations with the Board of Health to address some of the issues that we've already heard this evening, I think it's more appropriate for them to help to address some of those issues. I realize that's a separate licensing process, but at least to get their input on those things, particularly rats and any other trash, um, noise, lighting, we heard a lot of things like that. Those are all nuisances that they can help to advise upon. Um, and then lastly, um, we talked about a lot of things that relate to traffic, engineering, trees. That's all under the DPW. Um, so I'd like to also uh, reach out to my colleagues at the DPW to talk to them about uh, reviewing any of your existing plans and the updated ones. Um, and then I have a bunch of other you know, little notes that I think that we can follow up on that came from this discussion as well as the comments from the public. So we will summarize this and email to you tomorrow and follow up from there. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Jenny. That was well seen. Any other comments from the board? We'll see them next month. Yeah, so I think what I'd like to do is uh, move that this hearing be continued to December 16th, uh, likely in this room, but room to be determined. Uh, it's in the auditorium. In the auditorium. Okay, it's not all auditorium. So motioned. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everyone from the public who came out tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we do have uh, one more item this evening, which is the open forum. So if there's anyone in the audience who wishes to speak.
speak to anything else uh, other than marijuana discussion. Marijuana discussion, if you wish, uh, go ahead. Call on me now, Mr. Loretta. Thank you, Mr. Um, do you want me to use that or not? You can pass that. I, I back. Uh, I came before you about four months ago with um, we requested changes to the zoning bylaw for the next town meeting. I don't know whether you discussed them anymore or where that's going, but I'd like to get a sense of that because the town meeting warrant is opening shortly. And if you're not going to do anything with it or even consider it, then I want to hear what my other options are. Go ahead. Um, so, uh, actually, I don't have a copy of that. I, I know that you handed a copy to one of us that evening. Could you provide me with a copy sure. of that? And then, uh, related to that, we actually, I am planning to have a conversation about warrant articles. One of them uh, would be on December 2nd at their next meeting. And then, depending upon, uh, December 16th is getting a little crowded at the moment. So it will probably be the first meeting in January where we will talk about other warrant articles. There's not anything big coming from this board. Is that all being talked about for fall special town meeting, a fall special town meeting? So anything that this board will be discussing, there will be a little bit on December 2nd, and then the rest of it will be probably in early January at this point. I'll so email you what I gave to them. If, if you could just provide it to me, then I can distribute it to the entire board. Okay, I'll do that. Okay. Thanks, that would be great. All right, thank you. Thanks. Anything else to discuss? Questions, comments, concerns? All right, seeing none, we will take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Aye.